what I, I wanted to tell you a little bit about today is the dust. Uh, is about uh, what we know or don't know, because we don't know anything, basically, about the dark side of the universe and what keeps us awake on, at night, not only because some of us are optical astronomers and do observe at night, but, <laughs> but even Steve and I are not optical uh, uh, astronomers. He works with Frederick and observes during the day, and I'm working underground, and uh, does a, we don't know whether it's day or night. So, <laughs> uh, so, um, but there are really fundamental questions that I wanted to uh, address, and I would like this to be uh, as interactive as possible. So, uh, if you don't understand what I am saying, or if I am uh, um, too uh, technical. Please wave your hand, raise your hand, and and uh, don't hesitate, hesitate to interrupt. Uh, so, the first thing that I would like to uh, tell you is why do we think that most of the universe is dark? Uh, that is, it's made of the ordinary matter is something like four percent of the universe. So, what we are made of is only four percent of the stuff in the universe. And there is about 25% of uh, dark matter and 70% of what we call uh, dark energy. And so I will try to, uh, to get you through the arguments that we have, uh, why 96% of the universe is dark. And then uh, I'll briefly go give you some ideas about we, are we trying to decipher the nature of this dark matter and this dark energy. Because essentially we don't know what either of these two components are. Okay. So for dark matter, I will uh, uh, speak about something which is called WIMPs, weakly interactive massive particles. They were machos in the past, but they have disappeared. Uh, so, uh, and then uh, uh, how we can study gravity with dark energy. Okay, so uh, the standard model, that's the, uh, uh, that's basically the energy budget of the universe. You know, of course, that mass and energy are the same thing in, in general, in relativity. And so we don't make the distinction. You, you see what is happening there, 4% of atom, 22% of dark matter, 74% of dark energy. And, and we don't know what it is. Okay. The, uh, so let's start by asking ourselves, what, how much stuff is there in the universe? Okay, because uh, I gave you the pie, the, the, the pie chart and division, but okay, how much stuff there is? And there, uh, we have a pretty good idea because we still believe uh, in general relativity. I'll come back to that uh, a little later on the conclusion. Uh, and general relativity is a generalization of the Newton's theory of gravity. Okay. And uh, it has pr problems of its own because it is not a, we cannot quantize general relativity, or we can do that in a, a string theories in 11, dimen 11 dimensions. As, uh, but uh, uh, we don't need to bore it too much about that today. The, the thing which, uh, on the other hand, which is important for what we are discussing is that the curvature of the space around us is linked to the energy density and to whether the space itself is finite or infinite. And the, um, so you can say, what, what do you mean by, you can ask, what do you mean by the, uh, the curvature of space? Because we cannot look from the outside, we cannot see whether the thing is curved or not from outside. So, Actually, uh, since Riemann, 
who was a mathematician in the late 19th century, we know actually how to characterize the curvature of his space. Uh, because uh, basically, you can do that with what we call geodesics, the shortest path from one point to the next to the other in, in the space that we are considering. So in our ordinary three-dimensional space, which is flat, you know very well that the shortest path from point A to point B is a straight line between point A and point B. Okay, but if you are not Euclidean, if you are not flat, okay, the straightest path will not be a straight line. Okay, so uh, and the geodesics, what we call, what we call this, uh, uh, I should probably turn my phone off. <laughs> uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the space, the geodesics uh, will be curved. So for instance, we, uh, uh, the flat space I already said that if you take a sphere, for, for instance, the Earth, you know very well that the shortest path from here to, by plane to Paris is not to go, uh, uh, well, we cannot go straight first. Uh, and, <laughs> and, it's, uh, and it's not to go uh, at a constant latitude and go up at a const uh, constant longitude. It's a great circle, which actually goes fairly close to the pole. That's why when you are flying, you are to Europe, you are flying close to the pole. Okay, so that's what these great circles are geodesic in, uh, in a sphere. And um, this geodesic tends to converge. Consider, for instance, two meridians. Okay, they meet at the pole, and they meet again at the other pole. Okay, so although they are parallel at the equator, they meet. So Euclid, uh, Lemna, or, or postulate that two parallels never meet is wrong. And that's a characteristic of the fact that the space is curved. And you could, and the geodesic tends to converge. And then there is a negative curvature case where the space, the geodesic diverge. Okay? So, in terms of the universe, you can show in general relativity that if the space is flat, the energy density has a certain value, what we call the critical density. And we will measure that the density of space as a function of the universe in terms of this critical density. Okay? And we will call this quantity omega, which is the ratio of the density to the critical density. So if it's if the density is equal to the critical density, omega is equal to one. And you can show in general activity that we have infinite universe. Okay. If the energy density is greater than critical density, omega is greater than one, by definition, and uh, you have a finite universe. One way of thinking about it is that there is enough mass in, or energy in the universe, so it warps onto itself. And basically, it's finite. And uh, if uh, the energy density is smaller than critical density, omega is smaller than one, uh, we have a, uh, a negative curvature universe, which is infinite. Okay? So, how can we measure the universe geometry? So, it turns out that we can see radiation coming from the early universe, from the primordial plasma, what we call the cosmic microwave background. We can see this, uh, and uh, we can see oscillations in this primordial plasma, and we can compute the physical wavelength of these oscillations. We know the distance, okay? And so we can look, what is the angle there sustaining, sustaining the, uh, say, a wavelength of this plasma oscillation? 
Okay, this is the case where we are flat, where uh, the zero digits are straight lines. Okay, now if we are positive curvature, instead of the black uh, geodesics, you will have the red geodesics. And the angle, the apparent angle of these oscillations on the sky will be greater. And if the space was curved the other way, negative curvature, it will be like the green geodesics there, and the angle will appear smaller. And we were able, yes? No, 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 not at all. Uh, if it does, it's not, <laughs> I did not want it to change. <laughs> no, I don't think, no, 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 you are measure, say, it's between two maxima. Okay. Okay, so we, can, we have been able to do this measurement about 10 years ago with the microwave background. Uh, this was a, a telescope, uh, the Morang telescope, and we, uh, we were collaborating, uh, Berkeley was collaborating with this experiment. Uh, this is, uh, which was launched on a balloon at the South Pole, or more exactly at the McMurdo station. The, the balloon goes, there are winds which go around the South Pole, and the balloon was launched uh, circulated for about two weeks and came back to the same point and we dropped the balloon, we dropped the telescope. And we observed the microwave background. Of course, the fluctuations, the, the, the oscillation of the plasma are somewhat more complex than just one wavelength. There are lots of <coughs> spots and so on. But there is, you see, there is a typical, there is a typical sign, and that's what we use. If we are flat, that's what we would predict. And you see roughly the same side. If we were uh, a positive curvature, the angle is bigger and the, the, the blobs will look larger. And vice versa, if the angle, the, if we have negative curvature, like on a saddle of a, uh, 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 a saddle, uh, then uh, the same, the typical size will look uh, smaller. And uh, the angular size implies that, that we see implies that the geodesics are straight, that the universe is especially flat. We had a better measurement now with the, uh, with the WMAP satellite, and we get omega, this 1.02 plus or minus 0.02. It should be 0.02, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, it's, uh, so it is actually very flat. Okay, so now we know how much matter there is, how much energy there is in the universe, the critical energy density. Okay, we have to try to understand what, how do we divide the part. So we can try to, well, of course, we know that there is ordinary matter because we are made of it. Okay, and we can weigh stars. But that's not very much compared to this critical density. Less than 1%. Okay, so there is something which is missing there. So we can try to weigh galaxies. And uh, so what we do, the way we do it is to measure rotation curves. We are measuring with Doppler shift the velocity of objects going around the galaxy. If they are going around the galaxy, yes. Talking about the mass, the amount of mass in the universe, and you talked about the critical density, but density only tells you one parameter. How do you get scale? How do you know? No, this space is infinite. So if it's flat, it's infinite. So the, the total mass will be infinite. But it's a well defined quantity to take the mass and divide in a certain volume and divide by the volume. And that's what we call the density. <coughs> Yes. It is not exactly the same in, in all directions. It is uh, the same to within one part in a, a million. 
that if we look closer, there are fluctuations at the one part in a million. And we can look at the typical size on the sky of this, and that's of these uh, fluctuations, and that's what boomerang did. Other question? Yes. No, so we, uh, no, so uh, we have the, the problem that, okay, especially if we do the uh, optical observation, we have the galaxy in the way. So we tend to look up or down at what we call the no galactic north pole or the galactic south pole. As far as we know, they are, on average, they look essentially the same. We don't see difference between the north, the, the part of which is above the galaxy and part which is below the galaxy. Okay. Uh, so anyway, coming back to weighing the galaxies, so we can look at clouds. For instance, we can observe in the radio in 21 centimeter, or we can look that they emit some of the clouds, emit also a little bit of light, okay? And we can measure by Doppler shift their velocity. If these the objects are bound to the galaxy, uh, we have to balance somehow the centrifugal force that they, they, uh, uh, they, they are experiencing with a, a centrifugal force, which is, we believe, gravity. And if you compute the amount of mass that you need, it's much more than the mass of the star. Okay, and actually there is a, even something more interesting. So for instance, this is a, a galaxy M33, and we are looking at function of the radius, and the velocity that we measure is something like that. And it keeps increasing or it's flat. It does not decrease as if there was a just mass in the center of the galaxy. The mass does increase even though, as the radius, even though we do not see stars anymore. The mass increases even though we don't see stars. So there is something else on stars in the galaxy. Okay? And if you try to measure that, it, uh, uh, we have uh, at least 2% of dark matter compared to the critical density. Uh, and um, so I want just to acknowledge two major astronomers there who actually responsible for a lot of this work. There are Rubin, uh, 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 who is at Carnegie, and Sandy Faber, who is a professor at um, Santa Cruz. Uh, Sandy is about my age, and we are good friends. But they, they, they are responsible for a lot of this work, and very nice uh, people. Uh, now, there is another guy. There is another person there, <laughs> uh, Chris Vicky, who uh, uh, is dead, but uh, was a brilliant astronomer, but what was not so nice. Uh, he was he saying he was saying that uh, he was calling his colleagues uh, spherical bastards, <laughs> and why spherical? Because Whatever angle you look at them, they are always bastards. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh, the uh, what he, he was measuring uh, the coma cluster, which is an assemble of galaxies, about eight hundred of them, and uh, in a relatively small part of space, and he was measuring its velocity, their velocity. And uh, that's the plot of velocity as a function of radius. Uh, the mean velocity is something like 7,000 kilometers per second. It's just because of the Hubble expansion. But there is a big dispersion in the velocities of individual galaxies. And it says that these random velocities should not, are too large for these things to bind together unless there is dark matter. And he made this observation in 1933. 
Nobody believed him uh, till the mid 70s. Okay. But it's by far the oldest observation. So this is the coma clusters. We can also see, uh, uh, so these are galaxies. We can see also superimposed extra emission because there is gas which is very uh, hot. And the mass is so big that you can actually see the deflection of the light by the mass in the clusters. This is uh, uh, a, uh, a, a, a very massive galaxy, galactic clusters. And you see uh, in blue, okay, the objects which are blue are galaxies which are in the background. And in particular, there is one object this, which appears five times, there, 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 and there, which is a galaxy which is in the, um, uh, in the back, and which has been magnified by the lens of the, uh, of, um, given by the mass of the cluster. Okay. Anyway, uh, the short story there is that uh, the amount of dark matter that you get from the gravitational lensing or from the X-rays or from the dispersion velocity is roughly the same. So we are pretty sure that these things are much more massive than, than uh, the stuff. Okay, so when you do that, you get about 25%. So you try to measure the mass of the cluster. Okay? Now, let's uh, go back to gravity. Gravity dominates totally astronomy. Uh, and uh, uh, that's what we do. That's what we do. And because dark matter dominates gravity, uh, uh, everything uh, is built out of dark matter. And we believe that we would not be able to form galaxies if there were not dark matter around. Okay. And so, and basically, gravity is just an attraction. That's the only, oh, I have two equations in my talk. Acceleration goes at the mass density and one over the, the distance squared. And that's what uh, we, and this is actually interesting because uh, it is unstable. If you have a little bit more density somewhere, it will attract stuff from around it. And the density fluctuations will grow and grow and grow and finally form galaxies. Yes? yes. There is no speed of light at this level. There is, this is the, oh, this is a Newtonian gravity. So, yes, so there is no, okay, I will give you the, the second equation. I will give you the equivalent equation in general relativity. So, there is no speed of light. There is no time of propagation of, uh, and just say that the equation is the Newtonian gravity divided by Newton constant, Newton constant divided by R squared. And that's just the mass of the object, which, which is. Yeah, we, essentially nobody <laughs> believes this. <laughs> the CERN experiment, but <laughs> uh, uh, well, we are checking. <laughs> uh, to, no, it takes a few years. Okay. So anyway, uh, gravity is unstable, and that's where we form galaxies. And and uh, and uh, in, uh, I don't have the time to get uh, through that, but uh, you you are forming also uh, tend to put the the ordinary matter in the center of the galaxies, and that's what they form stars and uh, the X curve galaxies, and a halo of dark matter around it. Okay. So basically, uh, uh, that's what we can simulate. And this looks pretty much what we observe. There are small details, but there are much too many dots, small satellites there that we don't observe uh, that many, but more or less we can reproduce what is going on. OK, there are other uh, astrophysical evidence which gives us omega over the order of 0.3 for the, the course of uh, structure. Microwave background, the fluctuations that I was speaking of, we cannot measure them, and they are sensitive to the amount, the, fl 
the vibrations of the plasma is, uh, is uh, sensitive to the amount of matter, and we can get the total matter density of uh, 27%, roughly. So uh, we are pretty sure that there is dark matter. Now, we are also pretty sure that it is not ordinary matter. Because we can measure the matter, ordinary matter, uh, very well in two different methods with two different physics input, and we get the same result. And, and that's another big accomplishment of the last 10 years. So for some time, we had known that the baryon density baryons are protons and neutrons. OK, they are the ordinary matter. Uh, the electrons are coming with them. Okay. Uh, uh, it, it can be measured by the primordial abundance of light elements, like nuclei. Okay, helium, deuterium, uh, uh, helium-3, lithium. These things are produced in the Big Bang, and we can measure them. And we are roughly very uh, consistent uh, 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 measurement between all these uh, abundances and this points to a particular value of omega, which is uh, of the order of 4%. Totally different. The oscillations of our primordial plasma with the, cos the cosmic microwave background uh, also gives us some idea of the density of the baryon. And so you see, these are the power spectrum. We ana analyze in frequency, basically, what we see on the sky. OK? And this, this beautiful uh, uh, power, what we call a power spectrum, uh, a little bit like if you, if you were analyzing the noise, uh, uh, the frequency of, of a sound, that's the, that's the same idea. And uh, the, the relative height of these peaks are sensitive to the amount of baryon. And, sorry, they were supposed to tell, okay, come on, wait. The net result, this also gives 4% of the critical density. Totally different physics, totally different systematics. This is quite amazing that we get the same result. And it's 4% to, uh, uh, we say 10%, of beta actuation. Okay. We also know, so it's not ordinary, dark matter is not ordinary matter. It's very difficult to uh, uh, it. We also know that it is, uh, does not follow light. Okay, so let me, uh, I don't know whether, how I can st stop this thing again. So what we observe is the blood cluster uh, which as the blue is where the mass is, we can measure that with gravitational lensing, the same method I told you before. And the gas we can measure with, with x-rays and it's in red, that's where the gas is. So it's not that complex. And what we believe this, thing's, this object is, and uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll uh, sorry is two clusters merging or going through each other. And the dark matter keeps going because it doesn't interact. And the galaxies keep going because they're compact. And the gas, which is between the two galaxies, shocks with itself. The two the mass of gas shocks, get hot, and that's what we see in the X-ray. But we are still missing. So we have dark matter, something like 25% plus, yes. That's, that's gravitational. No, uh, the gas is not gravitational, it's electromagnetic. Okay. Th that's electromagnetic. That, that the, uh, the two, uh, uh, two masses of intergalactic gas in the clusters are really colliding uh, in the form and uh, become hot. And that's what we see in that case. 
but the dark matter does not uh, does not interact with itself, or, or, or at least not very strongly. Otherwise, it, it will not uh, behave as dark matter. But we are still missing seventy percent. Okay. Omega baryon, 4%, omega dark matter. My numbers are always uh, uh, changing a little bit. I should be consistent. But you see that's basically 30%. You are missing 70%. And that to appear relatively late. This additional component has to appear relatively late, because otherwise we cannot form galaxies. And uh, that's what we call dark energy. And how do we uh, see that? It's just by mapping the expansion of the universe. So the, our problem is that we have to look very far. Because we would like to see objects which are very early in the universe and try to, to see whether the expansion at that time is the same as now. Or more exactly, how we expect it should be a little faster, uh, uh, you know, because there is stuff in the universe. Uh, but okay, whether it, it, it uh, behaves according to expectation. So the uh, the objects that we are using are uh, supernovae. Uh, these are supernovae observed close to galaxies. And you see that the supernova is as bright or brighter than the galaxy. So we can see them very far. OK. And what is also interesting, uh, uh, that this a certain type, which we call type 1a, it doesn't matter what they are, can be standardized. That is, if we look at the, the light curves, that's time, and that's the amount of light that you observe from these objects. If we correct for the width, for instance, or for the rise time, we, uh, the full time, we can put them all on the same plot. And basically, we can measure the, we know the, the amount of light that the galaxy, that the supernovae are uh, emitting to better than 10%, which is quite interesting for astronomers. We don't do many measurements at 10%. OK? And what do we observe? Uh, we observe that if you plot the luminosity, and because we are astronomers, we are always plotting things the wrong way. So uh, the uh, no, we are totally historical uh, in nature. So magnitude was fainter, and this has this passed to B Babylon, and we have not changed the. <laughs> so things which are fainter are going that way. And this is the redshift, which tells us how far, uh, basically, the time at which the light was emitted. Okay, and uh, the the brightness tells us how far the object was. And you see that, and this is what the uh, two uh, publication in 1998 by Perlmutter and Company and Adam Brice and Company, showing that actually the luminosity of the supernova type 1a were fainter than we expected, which meant that the universe has accelerated its expansion. They are further away compared to what we expect, They're further away than, uh, than we would expect. Of course, you know, uh, these names now are familiar, Perlmutter and Adam Rees and uh, is, uh, the postdoc uh, who was uh, working with him, uh, uh, Brian Smith, uh, got the Nobel Prize this year. But it's this paper. So what does this mean? No, OK, so that's uh, Einstein playing with bubbles. This means that the universe is accelerating and that somehow gravity manages to be repulsive. And that's a big thing. Uh, and 
And now, it, does it become repulsive? Actually, it, it can happen in general activity. Uh, this were the expression that we wrote down for Newton. In the general activity now, we have the speed of, star, uh, of um, light appearing now. Okay, so uh, there is this one over c squared there. And then we have the energy density and three times the pressure which appears in the stimulated state. So if the pressure is large and negative, okay, uh, this acceleration, instead of being attractive, the force instead of being attractive, can be repulsive. And that's what we believe uh, is happening there. Oh, that's a volume. That's that's a volume. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm tr t I'm uh, cutting out a, a volume and I'm asking, what is the force, the gravitational force that this volume is uh, is exerting on something? Yeah, yeah, and yes, and I uh, have to put so. There's a certain energy density, so that's basically the same term as this one, but there is an addition three times the pressure. So if pressure is negative, and we believe actually that the dark, the dark energy has a pressure which is equal to minus the energy density, uh, very close to the minus uh, the opposite of the energy density. So this term becomes extremely negative and actually a split and even double the, uh, not only split the, the gravity, but double its strength. One minus three, which is minus two, and that double, doubling the strength. Yes? So this is all based on, on the uh, standard candle power. Yes. Is there anything else that could explain We uh, we have looked for the last uh, 13 years for this kind of things and no good uh, explanation has been given. And now, uh, but we have a, another reasons why we believe that is that we do know omega equal one. We know the, roughly the amount of dark matter and ordinary matter. And we are mi missing this 70 percent. Okay, and we know that it appears late. And to appear late, because uh, it has to have negative pressure. So we know from what, these are the supernovae, we know s something which looks very similar to what the supernovae would see. Okay, so that's the current status. Oh, uh, I, I, I don't think there have been a, a recent review. Maybe in the double price uh, lectures, there will be recent review. Uh, but, uh, uh, the uh, situation has, has not changed in terms of, uh, we are just more accurate. So, actually, I'm coming to your question there. How does this fit together? So we can put omega lambda, that's what we call the density in, uh, in this dark energy, omega in matter. CMB tells us that we are flat, the supernova tells us the cluster so it tells us that we have something of the order of 0 0.3, 0 0.25, and that's what the supernovae give. And all the evidence, pieces of evidence fit. Totally consistent, which is extremely su uh, surprising. That's the most uh, contrived universe you could imagine. So this form probably is the parametrization, and that's how we got the pie chart. Okay. Yes. Naive question. Could you give some intuition about negative pressure? What does that mean? Take, it, take a rubber ball and try to expand it. That will give you a negative pressure inside the ball. So it's uh, it's the opposite. The balance of pressure inside and out. Okay, so if you have a gas under positive pressure, it will expand. Yeah. If you have a rubber ball that you've expanded, yeah. and now it wants to contract. 
And that's what the negative pressure is. Yeah, and it's very strange. Uh, so general relativity is not as intuitive at all. The pressure is negative, and you would expect the things to contract. But no, the gravity becomes negative, and then it extends. Okay. Yes, yes. Uh, the number, okay, so I can give you a, a feeling. Uh, obviously, in general relativity, we have to take into account energy and momentum. The energy is the dense energy density term. The momentum is related to the pressure. The pressure is related to, okay, if you have particles bouncing on the, uh, in the gas, bouncing on the wall, the force is really related to the momentum of the particles uh, bouncing on the wall. So, and the number three comes from the fact that you have three dimensions. Yes. Yes, they do, and I uh, wanted to simplify it a little bit. Uh, so. In principle, they would not count as baryonic because, uh, in principle, the, a black hole has forgotten what, where it's coming from. But we know that if the black holes were formed recently, they would have been probably formed out of baryons. And then they are covered by the arguments on the number of baryons that I gave. Now, if black holes were formed in the very early universe, much earlier, then uh, this does not apply. Now, we have looked for black holes of the order of a solar mass or, uh, uh, in our galaxy, and, uh, uh, and we have, these are the machos that I was mentioning uh, before, and we have not seen them. And there are arguments, okay, we can cover actually a very large uh, a, a region of the mass of black holes where basically they don't appear to be the dark matter. Okay, so we have a number of questions. Why omega baryon is it of the same order of magnitude as omega matter, omega like that? And I did not speak about neutrinos, but they are a little less than that. But uh, why does the dark, mat dark energy appear now, or the last billion years, or two billion years? Okay, uh, what is the nature of dark matter? and what is the nature of dark energy. Okay, so uh, I will, uh, I should stop relatively soon. Ten minutes, okay. So let me uh, give you an idea about at least of the dark matter aspects, what, uh, what is happening there. So you can make a map of possibilities and I uh, don't want to enter. There are many possibilities. Uh, I would like to focus on one possibility just to give you an idea. This is uh, WIMPs, weakly interactive massive point. And one way is this very special class of candidates, and I try to summarize uh, uh, the basic idea there without any equation. Both particle physicists and cosmologists are miss are looking for a missing piece in the puzzle. And basically, you can a, a good comparison is to say that they believe that the piece which is missing has roughly the same shape. So probably it's the same piece which is missing. So the cosmologist is uh, say, if dark matter is made of massive particles, which were in equilibrium with the rest of the universe at early times, they should interact roughly at the interaction strength of neutrinos. And they are not neutrinos, we believe. They are massive, yeah. very massive. Particle physicist says, oh, our standard model is unstable. Even if they discover the eggs, or they have discovered the eggs, Okay, so the evidence is not yet uh, compelling. There is a problem. If 
the mass of the Higgs will go to infinity. And the mass of the W and Z will go to infinity. And okay, there are lots of things which happen, okay, which are bad. In order to stabilize, we need something like supersymmetry or some new physics at what the particle physicists call the TEV scale, Terra electron volt scale, which naturally contains stable, uh, which will stabilize the theory. And this will naturally contain stable particles, which interaction strengths, which are roughly the interaction strength of the neutrino. Okay, so the cosmologies want particle with interaction strength of the neutrino. The particle physicist wants to stabilize their model and what they are led to is probably particles which have about the same properties. So it may be just coincidence, or it could be that a powerful hint that we have uh, so, uh, that the solution. And that's what we call uh, uh, weak gas with massive particles. So there are three, three complementary approaches. So the dark halo of our galaxy is full of these winds, if they exist. So you can try to detect that on the, on the Earth. Because the wimps, the, the Earth is in the halo of our galaxy. The wimps will go through the Earth without any problem. And actually, we go, and that's what I do, we go underground to protect ourselves from as much stuff as possible. And we are looking for the small scattering of these wimps on very sensitive targets. Okay. You could try to look for the wimps annihilating with each other in the cosmos. And that's what gamma rays and neutrino detectors are trying to do. So that's the Fermi glass satellite. These are uh, Veritas in, uh, uh, in uh, Arizona. Or you can try to form, to produce these swims at the Large Hadron Collider. And we are living in this very interesting time where all three methods are roughly the same amount of sensitivity. Now, you know already that we have not observed anything because you wouldn't know about it. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, there is a, these are the winds, obviously. <laughs> Nothing against the Romans. And, <laughs> but I have much in favor of the, of the, the Gauls. Uh, <laughs> and oh, this uh, is being misplaced. I want, what I wanted to say is that we have actually a very large expanding community. Uh, we are more than 500 physicists worldwide uh, now looking for this dark matter by direct detection. We were zero 25 years ago. Okay, so. My mother, before she passed away, and I was one of the first few. Uh, my mother, before she passed away, told me, oh, I did not know that you are, that uh, you were that persistent. I've never seen you doing th the same thing for 25 years. <laughs> <laughs> so what's, that's what we do. We have detectors, which are kind of, uh, okay, let me finish and I will, uh, 7.5 millimeters. 75 millimeters, three inches uh, di diameter, about one inch thick, okay? And we are trying to look for interactions of the wimps into these guys. These guys are at very low temperature. It's not this temperature, which is just that the temperature at the surface. The mine in which we are is in northern Minnesota. And it's the coldest <coughs> place in the United States, actually. Then. And this is a picture taken Memorial Day. It was a cool Memorial Day. <laughs> and these are, but it's, these detectors are uh, put, uh, operated at very low temperature, 50 thousandths of a degree, sorry, Kelvin. 50, 50 thousandths of a degree above absolute zero. And we have to make, okay, so that's what we do. We have to be careful about radioactivity. We are, okay, that's, we are just installing a set of detectors and so on. So, uh, yes?
So they interact with themselves and produce ordinary matter, okay? Or they can scatter, uh, uh, they can scatter unordinary matter. Uh, okay, so it's somewhat model dependent, but we have actually something which is uh, normalizing everything is that in order for them to have the density today that they have, they have to have a certain interaction strength, which is a weak interaction. And that kind of roughly normalizes the thing. Uh, uh, so, uh, okay, let me go rapidly the general situation. So, we have limits, basically. So, this should put the cross sections of WIMP nucleon versus the WIMP mass. And basically, everything which is above this curve is excluded. Excluded. Yeah. Except, and that's my next point, except that you see these blobs, these things, and these guys have said that they observe something. Okay. Uh, oh, no, okay, so far no signal either from the LHC and the Fermi. Except that if you believe, if you uh, look at this, listen to this guy, says we have observed wind. Actually, uh, in the low mass region, in particular, there is this, this, another experiment which says that. So the, they say all they observe, they say that they observe something. Dama is the most famous one with a modulation of the signal of the tw last 12 years, the only problem is they don't observe the same thing. And the other problem is that they are incompatible with much more sensitive experiments, including ours. Uh, I think we are practically uh, 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 solid counter evidence. So, yes? Except that the sine wave is summer winter. And just the weather on, on the. No. Yes, experimental. Uh, so we do observe, also, we do expect a modulation if there is a wind signal because the Earth is rotating around the sun. It turns out that it's also lined up with summer and winter. But the, the muons, the cosmic muons, are also modulated roughly the same way. Okay, so that's the, that's the subtle effects which are difficult. Okay, so it's a very lively discussion. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and these guys are, <laughs> I think, in trouble. <laughs> Okay, uh, so this, this, uh, okay. Now, of course, we eventually come back and we'll get, uh, have a big meal together. Actually, we do uh, speak quite a bit about getting united. We have a common roadmap where here we are, this is the cross section of this map. And we are a little bold, but we are thinking of doing about a, a gain of a a factor thousand in sensitivity in the coming ten years. I don't, I don't have the time to speak about dark energy. Let me conclude. Uh, <laughs> you can always ask me questions. <laughs> so I think we have a fascinating time in cosmology at the moment. Extra extraordinary progress with. PNBR, large scale structure, but we have profound mystery about this dark side. What is it? And the, the model that we have is totally unnatural. And, uh, and actually, some people, including me, have been worried about this comparison with epicycles in the Greek astronomy, where, you, the, as you remember, uh, don't let me. Okay, 100 AD roughly, had a very good re rep uh, description of the planets orbiting around the Earth. And because the observations were not 
that were too good, they had to have the planets orbiting on circles rolling on circles. Because circles were the perfect shape. That was the theoretical argument. The, the only problem is that, of course, uh, everything was centered around the Earth instead of being centered around the Earth itself. Are we making the same kind of mistake? Every time that we measure something in cosmology, we have to introduce something new. Okay. So we have really two scientific priorities to detect dark matter and to, uh, to better constrain the nature of dark energy. Okay. Uh, uh, for dark energy, I think, it, for me at least, uh, and many colleagues, it has, unless it's totally random and the universe has been selected to have a particular value of the dark energy, which I don't believe in minutes, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, it's probably we are touching something very fundamental about the quantum properties of gravity. Yeah, the supersymmetric particles are actually one of the primary candidates for these WIMPs. So the lightest of the supersymmetric particles will be stable and would be the dark matter. Now, uh, the Higgs does not necessarily imply dark matter, uh, uh, supersymmetry. The Higgs is a way for us to be able to introduce mass in our theories in a very elegant way in which our equations are not diverging. If you put mass by n, you have infinities cropping all over the place. If you put it with the Higgs mechanism, uh, uh, everything behaves. OK. But the problem is that once you do that, if you look at the next correct order correction, the corrections will add up and the mass of the Higgs will go to infinity, dragging the, the mass of all the particles with it. So we know that's not the case. Okay, so if something else has to happen. It could be supersymmetry, it could be some kind of global symmetry, it could be large additional dimensions. Uh, that's just the fad in the theoretical community. There is, but what we are pretty convinced that something else has to happen, and that's why the Large Hadron Collider is very important. It's important for the Higgs, but it's also important to see what is stabilizing the model. Now, there is, there is a tension. The most naive ways of supersymmetry uh, are basically excluded by the current results of the LHC. So there is about a, a workshop every week where we are scratching our heads and saying, okay, some people like the older, like me, the older members of the community says, don't worry, uh, it's not, I'm quoting Steve Wender there, it's not a, a law of na nature that theorists have to be right. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, <laughs> uh, and it could be uh, it, it could be uh, s something else. Yes. I was just wondering, um, other than the purposes of answering the mysteries of what um, is taking up all that other area, uh, are there any uh, putting it out with dark matter and dark energy are specifically are there any kind of tangible real world Uh, it's, 
you are uh, asking me to be very uh, visionary. <laughs> uh, when the when the common matter physicists were dealing with germanium and properties of electrons and germanium, they said it looked pretty esoteric. Okay, we have a whole civilization uh, based. Uh, germanium was too difficult to use, so we use silicon. But we have a whole civilization based on silicon. Okay, uh, so it's always very difficult. Another example, also at Bell Lab. By the way, uh, Charlie Towns, and he was a young physicist, uh, 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 was called in by his boss and said, Charlie, you have to keep, you have to do something else. We, I don't see how uh, this kind of molecular spectroscopy has anything to do with telecommunication. Charlie Towns was inventing the laser, which is. <laughs> <laughs> Which is uh, very simple. So it's very difficult to, to, to guess where things are, uh, are going. Uh, this being said, uh, dark energy is only seen at very large distances, so I don't know exactly what you can do, but with it, uh, I'm sure that there will be science fiction trying to master dark energy to go, uh, science fiction novels to try to master dark energy to go, to go uh, very far. I, I have no idea. I have no idea. But on the other hand, let me go back to the philosophy. The philosophy is actually interesting. Uh, not only we are not at the center of the universe, we know that for, for a long time, but we are not even made of the stuff the universe is made of. So in some senses, that's the ultimate Copernican revolution. But that's what we see, well, more exactly, that's what we don't see. Uh, we see the dark matter through its gravitational effect. We don't see any interactions uh, uh, with electromagnetic uh, waves. The only interactions that we see is the gravitational interactions. It, dis it, it deflects uh, light, but we don't see uh, it. Uh, and we can put limits on the uh, on the interaction rate uh, with other matter uh, and with with electromagnetism. The limits are more sensitive from your direct detection experiments. Yeah, but there are other limits which are related to, for instance, the the bullet cluster uh, or interactions. Uh, we can also put limits of the dark matter with itself. Yeah. No. Yeah, to give you an order of magnitude, if it's indeed made of WIMPs with, say, typical mass and what times the mass of the proton, there are billions of those particles going each of, through each of us every second. Fewer than neutrinos from the sun, but quite a bit. Uh, 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 so the problem is that we, don't, we have to try to detect them their interaction rates are so small that it takes uh, a lot of precaution. The current limits that we have are about three interactions per kilogram of target per year. Per year. But you're actually quite a good limit detector. But yeah, we, <laughs> each of us. detections per year. <laughs> yeah. But okay, they, they deposit very little energy, which is totally masked by, and that's why we are using low temperature techniques, uh, because uh, uh, to be extremely sensitive, basically. So. The baryons, the ordinary matter of which we are made of, is only 4% of the stuff in the universe. And, and then I guess the other part is that uh, you just see it if you have a, 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 a,
Oh, okay, so I have to speak about that. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, I should have brought a, 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 a slide. So, the, essentially, none of us, including the authors, are really believing that uh, uh, that's really the case. Uh, the technical problem is that, okay, so we are sending neutrinos for about 700 kilometers between Geneva and Rome, basically. Uh, and um, they arrive 20 nanoseconds, they appear to arrive 20 nanoseconds, 20 billionths of a second earlier than we expect. And so we know the distance pretty well. We know the, the time. We can synchronize our clock pretty well uh, because we use uh, GPS. Uh, uh, and so there should not be any problem with that. On the other end, the, the particle, the pulse length of the neutrino is, if I remember well, 16 microseconds. It is 1,000 times larger. So how do you detect either the average position of the pearls or the edge of the pearls with, with our systematic at, uh, in one part in Sarge? So that's the problem. That's the problem. And so there are many proposals of saying your pulse is, instead of being square or rectangular, okay, constant for a given time, it's a little tilted one way, tilted the other way, and that that can basically change the average. Okay, so I have one more question. <laughs>